first of all, good afternoon to everyone and welcome to our one of the uh, online dialogues. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, and really sincerely hope that uh, all of you, your families and friends are well, healthy and, and, and safe. Uh, so as Ranasa mentioned, we have a very interesting topic and a wonderful speaker uh, to talk about that topic. Uh, but first of all, let me again very quickly give the very brief introduction of, uh, of OPP. Uh, so as you know, most of you know, uh, OPP is a platform for the people of Pakistani origin, but actually it could be anyone to promote progressive values in a multicultural environment. Uh, our vision reads unity and diversity, and our mission is to... Okay. Are we back? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, our inclinations, politically, we believe in democracy, human rights, minority rights, gender equality, and we have no affiliation with, uh, with any political party whatsoever. On the religious side, we believe in separation of uh, state and religion. Uh, and on social side, we believe in inclusion, tolerance, accept acceptance, and harmony. So this is a very brief introduction. Uh, people who are interested in more information about overseas progressive Pakistanis or the OPP, you, there are various ways to get in touch with us and read more about us. So you can always send us email uh, or, or post a message on the Facebook and we will be more than happy to respond with, uh, with more information. Uh, back to, to today's topic, uh, let me first just in a couple of sentences elaborate what this is about or what this is not about, which is more important today. It is not about any religion, any faith or any particular faith. We are not going to debate differences in faiths or conflicts in faiths or, or, uh, or with the society because this is not the scope of this topic today because then we will be drifting away from the main topic. It is also not so much about discussing the conflicts. Conflicts, although these conflicts are inevitable, they will obviously come up during the course of the discussion. But what is really about is that how do we handle these conflicts? What are these conflicts? How do we handle them? And if we don't handle them properly, what are the impacts of it on our society? And when our society, when I say society, it's in large on our culture on our education, economics, uh, social relations, and everything. And, and, and I'm sure that uh, uh, Professor Dr. Rudbai is going to touch upon these impacts uh, before we go into, into any discussions. Uh, let me start the topic with, the, with a quote from Carl Sagan. Everyone, I guess everyone knows him. He said, so just, just to set up what is science and what is faith. So he said that science is an ongoing process. It never ends. There is no single ultimate truth to be achieved after which all the scientists can retire and they say mission accomplished. So it is a, it's, a, it's a permanently ongoing thing. On the side of the faith, the, the, the description, the way people describe it, uh, famous Corrie ten Boom, she said, faith sees the invisible, believes the unbelievable and receives the impossible. And Dan Brown put it slightly differently. He said acceptance of that what we, which we imagine to be true, that which we cannot prove. So these are two different windows to the universe, if you wish, the, the faith and, uh, and science. And we will be talking at large about these things. Brief introduction of uh, Professor Dr. Hudbai. Dr. Saab, welcome. And thank you very much uh, for accepting our uh, invitation second time. It's really, really an honor and a pleasure to have you. We couldn't have thought of a better speaker on this, this subject. Uh, you have given so many talks on exactly this subject, and we are really looking forward to a wonderful discussion today. So Dr. Parvez Hudbai is one of Pakistan's most prominent academics, and not only academics, but he is an activist as well, like uh, Dr. Ishtiak, I mean, not only uh, involved in academic world, but put their academic knowledge into activity to change the, uh, the social system. He believes in, and he has been promoting the freedom of speech, secularism, <laughs> he writes, and he speaks extensively on topics ranging 
from science and Islam to education and disarmament issues around the world. He's author of Islam and Science, Religious Orthodoxy and the Battle of Rationality. He regularly writes and we publish his articles, especially in Dawn. Occasionally they, they, they are published and we always share them widely. So he writes in national and international media. One of his uh, recent uh, ventures is, uh, which he started, if I'm correct, on 5th of March this month, uh, the, the Black Hole, which is a community center in Islamabad. And in fact, despite not being very well, Dr. Hudbai was uh, just a couple of hours ago, had a two hour lecture in Islamabad uh, on, on infinity. Uh, and I could only attend like about half of it. Uh, very interesting. Uh, so my request to all our audience, our friends, although I have shared this widely, is that whenever you have time, please go visit their website, visit their Facebook page and see if it is relevant for you or not. And uh, if you wish to attend those programs and support that, uh, that initiative in whichever way you can, I think it will be very good. Uh, back to the topic and over to you, uh, Dr. Rudbai. Let me take slight issue with you, Vahid sir, on the issue of uh, the inevitable conflict between religion and science. That's how a lot of scientists look at it, but not all scientists. In fact, you could, um, you have roughly between five to 10% of scientists who are believers in a formal religion, and then some fraction who believe in some kind of a greater God uh, Spinoza's God was something that uh, Einstein didn't differ with. And so the conflict may not be inevitable, but it is certainly there. <clears throat> we see that conflict again and again. And I've, I noted that you said that we shouldn't get into specifics, but without specifics, then we will surely lose out on a lot. So something like um, three months ago, there was this, uh, this this big news that a pig heart had been transplanted into a human. And that human, the patient, was surviving and doing well. What was even more earth shaking was that the surgeon who had done the transplant, there were actually more than one, but one of the surgeons was Muhammad Mohyuddin, a Pakistani from Karachi, and also a believer from what I've read about him is that he was, when he was going for the transplant operation, he had turned on his car, he turned on the speaker system of his car and was listening to voices to the recitation of the Quran. The amount of vilification that the poor man has had to go through is actually quite stunning. How is it that a pig, the most filthiest of animals, has had its heart implanted in a human? That's the ultimate denigration of, of a man. That, of course, is the traditional view in Islam. And in fact, the pig is hated to the point that uh, I have a big fat dictionary over here behind me. If I look through it, I don't find the word the Urdu, Sur, Khanzir is omitted from that. If you look at uh, our children's books, you will see that even um, there, there's, there's never, never any mention of it. And in fact, po even Porky Pig was censored at one point in Pakistan. So it's, uh, it's really quite shocking to a lot of people here. And so uh, Muhammad Mohyuddin, Dr. Muhammad Mohyuddin, a lot of negative commentary and even somebody as progressive as uh, Javed Ahmadi, who is a preacher, who is uh, known for his liberal interpretations of Islam, found this very distasteful to say the least. So now let's understand this whole issue in detail. I don't mean just the issue of the pig's heart, but also the issue of organ transplantation. And beyond that, the notion that 
that the human body is actually material, that it is actually a mechanical system. So for that, let's go back something like 400 years, 17th century, just before Newton, there was the French philosopher René Descartes. And Descartes did many wonderful things. One of the things he did was make all the, was create the Cartesian coordinate system. His other contributions, there were many, were in philosophy. And one of them was that take a complex system. To understand that system, break it into many, many parts. Understand each of those parts, and then you will understand how the system works. Apply this to the human body, and the human body turns out to be a machine. This hand over here is a lever. This ear is a microphone. The heart, which is at, which has so much romance, so much associated with it, that heart is nothing but a mechanical pump. That was shocking. It was, it was something that was uh, absolutely new for those times. It didn't catch on uh, immediately, but over time, the truth of that became established. Then, if you have this machine, then the parts of the machine are replaceable. And so later on came the idea that you could change the blood in that machine, the, the fluid that keeps it moving. Initially, blood transfusions didn't work out. You had to have the matching of these various blood types, but it did eventually. Then came the idea of replacing other body parts, the kidneys, the liver, and above all, the heart. The first heart plants, transplants failed. They failed because of the fact that the body rejects, automatically rejects something new that intrudes upon it. And so that rejection has to be then suppressed. But if you suppress it too much, then the body becomes susceptible to other diseases. And so you have to have just the right balance. Now, obviously that balance was not met in this particular case. The big heart recipient died after two months. And uh, I should say that in uh, places here, I did read that this is how it should have been, that this was divine retribution. You can't, that article said, have tampering with humans and despoiling them, despoiling them. Well, look, this is, the, the, the pig transplant didn't work this time. The immunosuppressants weren't calculated. The patient was weak. But in time, this will work. There's no doubt about it, that it will work, just like other transplants do work. And so once again, it will be that science will emerge triumphant. Watch this happening unfold. Watch this unfold over the next uh, few months, few years, and it will follow that inevitable trajectory. So when issues like this come up, then there's always the question, why religion? If it is always to lose, then why religion? So now let's go back to the evolutionary history of mankind, of humankind, I should say, that's better. Let's realize that animals don't have a religion. Religion is the product of human intelligence. It arises because we want answers to questions. Those answers couldn't be given at an earlier time. So the issue of why is there thunder, lightning? Why do floods happen? Eclipses, 
shooting stars? Why do the planets move around in those particular orbits? So a whole bunch of questions, which didn't seem to have answers because science wasn't developed enough up to that point. But then as we got to know science better, some of those questions got answered, but not all. And so the question is, will science eventually become so overarching, so comprehensive that it will have answers to every conceivable question? My take on this is no. I don't think that it will ever happen that there will be mysteries which are beyond science. I don't say they contradict science at all. I say they are beyond science. And the biggest one of these is what's the purpose of human life? People are very worried about why, why they exist. I think each of us has uh, gone through that stage of life as well. I certainly did. Some people remain worried to the very end. Some people reconcile and say, well, we're here, we're here. We won't worry about it further. And some people come to the conclusion that it doesn't matter. We, we come from atoms and at the end, we will become fertilizer. So grow vegetables in your, in your patch with uh, what I donate you from my body. It's something that at this point, when you think about it rationally, has uh, these options available to it. We will never know why we existed on Earth and we will never know what was the purpose of the universe. It's true that we are today very well placed to understand how the universe came into existence. So something like 13.7 billion years ago, there was a singularity in space time that evolved exactly as it should under the laws of physics. Then over those eons, we had the creation of, we had stars being formed from the stars, the planets from the planets, life and so forth. And it's very probable there will be life in other parts of the universe. But that will not answer the question, why are we there? So um, in that sense, so I've, I've put a long introduction up ahead to tell you that um, religion will always be around because there will always be people who are unsatisfied with the question, why are we here? And science will not provide them that answer. It will not give them that satisfaction. And so religion will be around. Having said that, I don't think that, that religion will be around in its present form. And I also think that religion will itself mutate. It will mutate into forms that are less harmful to human progress than they have been in the past. At the same time, there will also be a virulent strain that will, that will seek to drag us back into the past. And here it is up to us, those who try to understand society and to influence it to minimize its harmful effect. Again, I repeat that there is a benevolent part to religion. That part is, it gives you solace. If it made Mother Teresa look after hungry kids in Calcutta, that's fine. But if it is, uh, well, Mullah Omar or Osama bin Laden or Khadim Hussain Rizvi, these are people who mobilize religion and who mobilize it to take us back into the past, believing that 
the best existed in the past. There's nothing that can com be compared with that lying in the future. So these are the genuine retrogressive influences upon human society. And there's no question that they must be combated as best as we can. Not necessarily through force of arms, but if yes, if that is necessary, that too has to be done. Now I want to give you uh, a snapshot of how things went in Islam. And uh, before that, how things went in Christianity as science developed. There is a wonderful uh, two volumes written by Andrew Dixon White. It's, I think I have it here. I, I could, um, unfortunately, I didn't pull it out of my library in time, so I won't look for it. But Andrew Dixon White was the was the first president of Cornell University, and he wrote this something like 150 years ago. It's titled the the war between Orthodox Christianity and science, something like that. I forget the exact title. And it's got detail after detail of how Orthodox Christianity conflicted with with science. And this was at a time when science was discovering new principles. It was finding explanations for various physical phenomena that were being just found. And new cures were being found for diseases. Among the countless examples that he gives was the, was the uh, treatment meted out to the man who discovered the smallpox vaccine. I think his name was Dr. Boyle. When it was, when Boyle proposed that uh, this vaccine be used to, um, to suppress uh, the spread of smallpox, he was accused of interfering in God's work. And there was a lighted grenade that was thrown at his house in Boston or somewhere on the East Coast. That's uh, very much like uh, what happens when, when uh, polio teams go around in Pakistan and they try to get little kids to, to uh, take the polio drops. Something like well over a hundred polio workers have been shot and killed. It's the fear, again, that we are interfering in the work of God, in the work of nature. Andrew Dixon White gives so many brilliant examples. I mean, it's, it's, it's a book that's two books that are together about this thing. And they are all uh, such um, examples that uh, today we would uh, sit down and have a great laugh at them. For example, the argument that the earth cannot be round. Okay, so St. Augustine argues this. He says, if the earth was round, then it would have an opposite to it. If it had an opposite to it, an antipode as it's called, then Christ came at this point, there would have to be a second Christ at the other, at the antipode. But you can't have two, two Christs, there's only one, hence the earth is flat. All right, now that's not the kind of reasoning that uh, we're going to accept these days. That's what caused the brutal conflict between science <coughs> and religion. Galileo was very fortunate in this regard. When he built upon the Copernican system and insisted that it's the earth which goes around the sun and all the other planets go around the sun. Uh, he was a very uh, brave man for doing that. But then he got in trouble with the Pope and was sentenced to death and escaped only because he apologized. Now, why did this conflict came, come about? 
I mean, why does it matter that the Pope gets so worked up about uh, the earth going around the sun or the sun going around the earth? I mean, these are matters of detail, aren't they? Why does it matter so much? Why did it matter so much to the Pope? And the answer is, so far as I can think, is that the church claimed that it had the totality of knowledge, that it knew everything. And so even if something was slightly wrong, that's, that could disturb its, harm its credibility. And so therefore, Galileo had to be punished. Well, as I said, Galileo got off easily enough, but then what happened earlier to Wycliffe was something that everybody, um, that a lot of people um, uh, at that time were terrified of happening to them as well, because the poor chap was not only killed, but then his bones were taken out and uh, chopped into pieces and thrown in the river and all that. There was case after case, case after case, but eventually, eventually it turned out that the objectivity of science, the fact that you can then, you, you can actually prove what you're saying, prove in two ways. One is through logic, through sustained logic, which is connected. And secondly, in your ability to predict what lies ahead. Key to science is the scientific method. In the scientific method, you make a hypothesis. You then use that hypothesis to explain whatever currently exists, but then you go a step further and you say that now we are going to predict something that so far we have not seen. And if it's true, if it turns out to be true, then it's a victory for that hypothesis. Just you keep testing and testing. <coughs> and so <coughs> it, didn't, it doesn't matter who you are. <coughs> the fact is that in science, Objective, objectivity means that the personality and the person of the scientist becomes secondary. To give you a more recent example, Einstein. There wasn't a greater scientist in the 20th century. The man had invented the special theory of relativity, the general theory of relativity, but even more, he had invented a part of quantum mechanics, a very, I'd say, important part. And yet he didn't believe in quantum mechanics and he would tell young physicists, there is a serious, serious problem with quantum mechanics. I don't believe it and you shouldn't believe it either. And so that discouraged some people, but it didn't discourage the scientific community as a whole. And quantum mechanics today is the foundation of every, of, of, um, of particle physics, nuclear physics, condensed matter physics. You can see how many books there are. They're all over here. They all use quantum mechanics because that's now the foundation of all modern physics. We didn't believe Einstein. Einstein was very clever, by the way. He invented objections to quantum mechanics that turned out to be very, very smart, entangled states. And uh, that has led to uh, a new kind of direction uh, for physics also. But he did waste a lot of his own time and waste a lot of other people's times. So objectivity inevitably works out. And today, um, yeah, you can have religious scientists in the West, but um, they will not uh, try to justify what, they, what their scientific conclusions are on the basis of their religious thoughts. If they try to do that, they would be labeled as crackpots. And uh, although crackpots do exist in European and Western countries, but uh, their numbers are small and they don't make it up into the scientific hierarchy. 
So now that's how science developed after the Enlightenment period, after the scientific revolution. And uh, also, of course, the big boost came in 1945. And uh, sadly, that was the bomb that science gave to humanity. That's the negative part of science. But then um, let's, let's move on to how science developed in Islam, because I think that's going to be of, of interest to a lot of you, particularly if you ask the question, why has it ceased to develop in spite of much effort? So if we go back to the history of Islam, 7th century, 638, the Prophet passes away. There was no science at that time. Science entered Islam 150 years later, and it came because Islam, as it became an expanding religion, it, uh, it expanded to places uh, like uh, Baghdad and to parts of Iraq, where the Greeks had already been there and where they were the treasures of Greek learning from a thousand years ago. At the beginning, there wasn't um, much understanding of what uh, all this Greek stuff was. But uh, then some of the, of the enlightened caliphs, they started seeing something very useful in there and it piqued their intellectual curiosity. And so they ordered translations. People like Harun al-Rashid and al-Mamun, they engaged translators who then uh, had who, who translated from Arabic, from, um, from, from Greek into Arabic. And soon they grew to be quite a big body of literature. And around this literature, there grew a group of thinkers. They were called the Motazila. The Motazila became the rationalists of Islamic civilization. They prospered for 400 years. Many of the Khalifas, the Caliphs were Mu'tazila themselves. And in fact, I would say that without the Mu'tazila, there could not have been the Islamic learning that lasted between the 9th and the 13th centuries. That was a time when there were genuine new achievements. It was not just a question of, of uh, translating Greek into Arabic. The brilliance of the human mind is manifest in works like that of Ibn al-Hasham. And by the way, Professor Abdul Salam, uh, he introduced me to, he showed me a paper translated from Arabic into English, where you could make out that uh, he was getting close to Fermat's principle that light goes from this point to that point by traveling the path which takes the least time. Very interesting. This ferment of scientific activity lasted until the mullah woke up. Imam Ghazali, he came out against the Greeks, against Greek philosophy. And he said, the whole, the, this whole thing is wrong. It's wrong because ultimately, the power lies only with God and you should not, you cannot seek explanations of the physical universe through your mind. He was against mathematics. He said, per se, it's not bad, but if you study too much mathematics and you get in love with logic, then you will forget your faith. But what really killed science for those who subscribe to this line of thinking was his attempt to distance cause from effect. So this is um, 
Ibn Rushd, who, who came uh, just uh, a few decades later in Spain. Ibn Rushd, who's also known as Averroes, is a Muslim rationalist. He uh, is, in fact, the most celebrated one. And he criticizes Ghazali. He says, Ghazali says that if I light a match and put it to cotton, then the cotton catches fire because of that, because of lighting the cotton with a match. He says, no, 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 no. This is not the way it is. It's God who sends down angels. And it's those angels who set the cotton on fire. There is no connection between, of, between this thing that you have done and this thing which has happened. Or to give you another example. Imagine that this is a target and there is an arrow that is speeding towards it. It's getting closer and closer and you say it's going to hit the target. No, sir, you're wrong. No matter how close it gets to that target, it will not hit it because <clears throat> in one instant, God creates the universe. In the other instant, he destroys it. So create, destroy, create, destroy, create, destroy. So the connection between the cause and the effect is lost. You as a human cannot predict what will happen next. That's why we need inshallah. It is only Allah who can who can say what will happen. <coughs> can I say inshallah that the that a stone will fall down? Strictly speaking, I should say yes. In actual practice, people don't say that. But they do say, inshallah, there'll be rain tomorrow. Well, rain follows exactly the same Newtonian equations of motion that this stone follows as it goes to the earth. There's no difference. There's absolutely no difference except in the difficulty of the differential equations that we have to solve. Will it make a difference if in the pig's heart, Muhammad Mohyuddin, Dr. Muhammad Mohyuddin, had he prayed for his patient to survive, would that have made a difference? I'll let you have your opinion on that. My opinion is no. What happened was, okay, the immunosuppressants didn't work out or the rejection was too strong or the patient was too weak. Physical causes led to the patient's death. But a few years down the line, few months down the line, that operation will be successful. Who knows? It's material causes that lead to material effects. That's the essence of science. <clears throat> to give you another example, you remember HIV, AIDS? Terrible, <coughs> terrible thing. It was said that the population of Africa would dwindle to a fifth of its size because it was so widespread. It was said, I've heard it so many times being said that it is azab -e lahi it is the wrath of god for impious improper behavior well it was a virus wasn't it nasty one and we still don't know how to kill all viruses but we know how to contain this viruses and with all the HIV medicines that we have these days, patients' lives are, are increased to um, 20 years beyond, 20 years beyond if they didn't use those medicines. 
And so these are palpable, obvious things. And I don't know why some people put blinders on, on their eyes and say, no, we don't believe it. Why don't you believe it? Your entire lives now are dictated, are, are, are uh, oh, actually, to the success of the rationalist way of thinking. You wouldn't have, you wouldn't be traveling in a car, you wouldn't be going around in a jet plane, or you wouldn't have your, your mobile phone with you. And mobile phones, everybody has it. You wouldn't have the loudspeaker in the mosque, and there are plenty of them in this neighborhood over here. Those, where did they come from? They came from the application of electricity to particular ends. What is electricity? Flow of electrons. How did we know about electrons, etc. Et so, the writing on the wall should be up ahead. And yet the resistance is bitter. It is incredibly bitter. Let me tell you what they're teaching kids around over here. They're teaching them that Darwin is a bunch of crap. I mean, literally. So in the textbooks that I've seen, at least one textbook I've seen saying this, that which says in the first chapter, you must study the theory of revolution. Uh, the, you must study the theory of evolution because it is in your course, but don't believe it. It's all wrong. It's illogical. It makes no sense. And it's just like saying that, uh, and, and it says, and, and the whole idea of evolution is wrong because simple organisms cannot make more complex organisms and the proof given is the following it says imagine two rickshaws rickshaws are three wheelers if two rickshaws collide with each other they don't make a car they don't make a four wheeler they remain three wheelers so the the resistance to darwinian evolution is bitter. Of course, it's true in the United States as well. It's much more pronounced here. But where then does this get us? If we don't believe in Darwinian evolution, then there's no question of being able to invent a vaccine for COVID. A vaccine for COVID could be invented and you see the effects of that, it has been, well, extremely effective now. It could be invented because we understood that viruses, when they are subject to a certain environment, they will prosper, change the environment, they will die. It's survival of the fittest, survival of the fittest virus. And we also understand that those viruses can mutate and mutation is a part of the theory of evolution. Now, Darwin didn't know about DNA, but when DNA came along, it fitted so naturally into the theory of evolution. So I think I'll pretty much end over here so that I can get questions from um, many of you. The, the, the question that uh, Vahid Saab had raised was, how do you deal with this? And I say, um, you deal with it respectfully, but you deal with it firmly. You don't compromise your, your essential principles on this. We know, we know that physical causes lead to physical effects, and we should never, never say otherwise, even if it is dangerous. So I'll end over here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, for. Uh... Uh, very nice talk uh, and rational talk. Uh, so I'm going to open the floor uh, for opinions, questions, and uh, debate on it. Uh, but I request all of you, please uh, raise your hands. Then I would uh, allow one by one. Uh, 
for the questions and your uh, opinions as well. Uh, but also uh, consider the time limitation here uh, and uh, be specific uh, in your talk and question. Yes. I just like to say two sentences to the, the first. Thank you very much, Dr. Rubai, very illuminating. Uh, you mentioned about uh, gravity, evolution, etc., and you reminded me of uh, what uh, Richard Dawkins once said. He said, uh, evolution is just a theory, so is gravity, and I don't see you jumping out of the windows. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very nice saying from him. <laughs> yes, questions, please. Yes, Dr. Lishyak, please unmute yourself and then ask questions. This is not a question, but just a comment on what sort of preconditions would facilitate, you know, for the Muslim world to break out of this stranglehold of orthodoxy. And I think if you look at how uh, in, in Western societies, this became possible was a number of things. One was, of course, the liberal idea that all ideas should have a free flow and people would, through their intelligence, make out what is good and what is bad. This came with J.S. Mill. Then the separation of state and church in the American constitution, I think, set the basis for uh, people to think freely without dogma being imposed on them by the state. So things like this, I mean, uh, the creationist theory couldn't hold water very long because of several centuries of discoveries, beginning with Copernicus and the names you have uh, given us. Nothing of this has happened within the Muslim world since, let's say, the Mongol invasions of 1258 and then orthodoxy, as you so correctly point out, uh, accepting the formula that God cannot err. If God's truth is perfect, then reason must submit to it. This is Imam Ghazali. Uh, we need to continue uh, questioning this scholasticist school of thought. The only philosopher we keep on talking about in our own times is Iqbal. And Iqbal ultimately submits to the same logic of uh, uh, Imam Ghazali. So I think what we need somehow is to emphasize certain preconditions, uh, which if they are not fulfilled, we will continue, you know, being uh, uh, in this quagmire of orthodoxy. And one is of course, every person has the right to express a view freely and the law should defend that right of the individual. This was just a comment. I mean, what would enable Muslim societies to get out of this stranglehold of orthodoxy? Uh, so just an opinion. Well, I, I let me just add on a little bit to what you said. First of all, a small comment that you're absolutely right about Alama Iqbal. Alama Iqbal was bitterly critical of um, Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina, and he said that these people, what have they done? They merely copied the Greeks. <laughs> these are two of the greatest scientists that Islamic civilization produced. So uh, Iqbal was very much of the idea that we must reject these accretions into Islam, particularly the Greek uh, uh, accretion. He wasn't fully, he wasn't 100% with Ghazali, but he was 90%. There. Mm. In terms of um, what has happened with the Muslim world, I think here there's a lot of analysis that's needed. After decolonization, the Muslim world was moving towards modernity. In um, my early years, so in the 1950s, Pakistan was becoming more and more modern by the day. And 
it uh, uh, on even beyond Ayub and into the Bhutto area era, we were moving in a direction which um, was emphasizing science, education, acquisition of technologies. I could say the same was true for Iran. And until the Iranian revolution, uh, Iran was very rapidly modernizing. One can see modernization at work in other parts of the Muslim world. So the Ataturk revolution in Turkey, and then somewhere around that, somewhere uh, in the subsequent decades, that modernization stopped and we started going the other way. And here I won't say that um, this doesn't have a political origin to it, because if you see uh, that the Shah of that the Shah of Iran was propped up by the Americans, there was um, it was a very brutal regime of the Shah. The reaction to that then led to the Khomeini kind of radicals destroying Iran's uh, very advanced. Um, uh, learning infrastructure, but not fully. Even today, Iranian culture is vibrant and it has wits, withstood the, the imposition of Mullah rule. I see some of Iran's um, professors in particle physics, in quantum field theory, as being absolutely brilliant. Turkey has had a bad run too under Erdogan. But maybe this is not going to last forever. I am more worried about Pakistan than I'm worried about Iran or Turkey or Indonesia or um, even um, Egypt. Uh, I think it's different from in different places. By and large, I'll say that the world is becoming more cosmopolitan. It's true that Muslims are still way behind, but the parts which are catching up. And if you look at uh, uh, Muslims in the West, there is a fraction of them which has now understood that the way ahead is by dumping the old ways of thinking. I agree. I mean, this was just an observation, but I totally agree with the, the historical fact that you have told us. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, Dr. Shab, uh, there is a question from uh, Nasser Jalil sir, in uh, chat uh, box. Uh, he's asking, science and faith are two different belief systems, two different paradigms with unique different assumptions about ontology, epistemology, methodology, and methods. They generate different explanations. Do you agree? Yes, but they better not uh, uh, generate different explanations for the same physical phenomenon. It's all right to say that uh, religion says and says this and science says this, but let's say when it comes to disease, in the examples I gave you, HIV, AIDS being one, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't uh, subscribe to the notion that uh, HIV is um, azabi illahi, the wrath of God. The issue of miracles is also very troubling because miracles relate to physical events. And now let, let me give you how Muslim modernists have looked at miracles. Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan is the foremost example of a Muslim modernist on the Indian subcontinent. And he was very troubled by the, by the conflict between science and, science and Islam. And he spent a good fraction of his life reinterpreting the Quran in a way that it would make it consistent with science. And I'll tell you briefly how he did it. He took the way of the Mu'tazila. He said, suppose it says in the Quran that something, some miracle had happened. Let's say the Salab no, Noah, the flood of Noah. It is, um, well, first of all, you have to understand what flood means, the word for that in Arabic, the antecedents, the precedents. So look at it, do a linguistic analysis. 
take every word that's in the Quran that relates to it and just uh, look at the meanings it could possibly have be it could possibly have had uh, 1400 years ago. Then see if you can come up with an explanation that joins them together. If you can't do that, then take the following route. Accept that the Quran is the word of God. And of course, the word of God can never be false. On the other hand, what science tells us is, is uh, testable truths. And so th there's something wrong with us, not with religion, that we haven't been able to reconcile them. His prescription there was believe what science tells you in those areas where these, there is an overlap. As long as there's no overlap, fine. That's not an issue. It's only when issues like this come up that we run into problems. And let me give you another example because, ah, no, because just let me give you another example. The question of why are there earthquakes? Science has an explanation. It says the earth was <coughs> was molten. It solidified. Plates were formed. One plate slides under the other. That goes up. The earth shakes when that happens. It's got nothing to do with what people on the surface have been doing. Uh, whether they're good people or bad people, things will happen in exactly the same way. So how does one reconcile that? I'm, I'll wait for someone to tell me that. To my mind, it can't be done. Yeah, so I take a question uh, from uh, uh, R underscore <coughs> uh, It shows me. Oh, yeah, please. Uh, Sorry, my name is Rajiv Prem, just the username. Yeah, Rajiv, Rajiv, please. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, first, I would like to thank Professor Ishtiak Amrath for sharing the link on Facebook and uh, Google. So I came to know about it. And thanks, Professor, for the, this nice talk. <clears throat> I'm going to give a little different uh, question, but like, it's not exactly on that. See, when I read uh, Rahul Sankar, Sankarti Yan, who was a, a big time philosopher, left home, learned Sanskrit, Pali, Arabic, Persian, traveled to like all parts like China and uh, brought all those books of Buddhism and everything. He wrote a book. In this book, he shows that the first religion that gave uh, man to man and man to woman equality is Buddhism. Then he gives some small sects in between. Then he says, okay, so Islam is the second biggest religion which gave some rights to women and uh, also to man to man equality. And then comes Marxism. And in between they are small, and he gives it very nicely. I forgot the name of the book. But when we look at now in today's world, in Islam, it's completely that women have hardly any rights. So my question to pro Professor uh, is, is it like having this kind of mentality, not giving equal rights to women, we also went away from science? Like we have lost, like what you call, a, a opinion or point of looking at the things from a different way because we put women behind or disenfranchise them? Maybe he can comment on that. Thanks. Well, this isn't exactly on science and religion. This is on... Um... Uh, religion and ethics, uh, religion and morality. <clears throat> but uh, let me say that all religions have given women a secondary status or a tertiary status. And that means all of them. It includes Christianity, it includes Judaism, it includes Hinduism. And it's, uh, it's uh, the patriarchal structure of human society that's ultimately responsible for it. So Islam um, gives it divine sanction, but then Islam is also open to interpretation and you have a lot of feminist uh, 
Islamist radicals who will say that uh, the way that the mullahs interpret it is completely wrong and they'll bring out radical new interpretations. And I say, good luck to you. That's fine. That's a way to go about it. I mean, you have to see how things bad were um, in Hinduism also. Uh, if you Before the British came, um, Muslim women and Hindu women weren't um, very different. I mean, they, they, their treatment wasn't all that different. And the whole issue of sati was uh, something that, okay, uh, people um, have largely forgotten about, but it certainly was an issue then at the time of the British. Uh, professor, I would like, to, I think uh, there's miscommunication. I'm saying that the uh, Buddhism and Islam gave some rights to women. Hinduism doesn't accept women as a, what you call a independent identity, give any, any independent identity. Yeah, and Rajiv, uh, may I inter interrupt you, please? This, this is uh, at this moment, this is not uh, our scope of uh, uh, the discussion. So uh, let it pass uh, um, otherwise. And after, um, you know, in uh, our informal session, we can uh, discuss on it. I, I want to take another question from Michael. Michael, please. Dr. Saab, uh, thank you very much again, you know, to, to just an enlightenment speech and, uh, and uh, telling everything about what is going on in Pakistan. My question, my first question is, Dr. Saab, how would you reconcile evolution with religion? We have evidence of evolution, but the religion saying, I mean, this story of Adam and Eve, they don't have, I mean, this, this is an old story and we respect it, but it hasn't got any evidence at all. And my second question is about Alama Iqbal. Now, Alama Iqbal studied in Germany he wrote such a fantastic poetry about sh Shikwa and every, and he was so enlightened and all of a sudden he becomes an ortho Orthodox Muslim. As you said, he became 90% Ghazali. So what, what actually happened in, in his mind that he changed himself just 180 degree? Oh. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the first question, I don't have much to say. I think I've already said most of it, that this is um, Darwin's theory of evolution is evidence-based. It was arrived at by looking at how diverse species are, how certain species have prospered, others have died out, and um, it has been vindicated in um, observation after observation. That's true, yeah. In terms of um, whether the first, whether there was a first person, um, Adam, and whether there was Eve, uh, that is, that has to be a belief only. If one believes that all humans, all animals were created at one specific time, then there are serious problems from a scientific point of view. Because the number of species has increased dramatically over time. Now, of course, it's going to decrease because of the global pollution issues and loss of uh, habitat and so forth. But the number of species has increased hugely from the time that we were single celled um, um, single cells only. So there is a conflict there and it's uh, probably irresolvable. There you will pretty much have to take sides, whether you're on the side of uh, objectivity or on the side of um, being told that something is this way. As far as Alama Iqbal goes, before 1905, he was uh, um, a person who was very accommodative. Sare jahan se achha Hindustan amara. 
and he was um, there was nothing in him that um, suggested that he would become a flaming advocate of Hindu Muslim separation. His reaction to the West came about when he left in 1905. And by the time he had come back in 1908, he was a transformed person. Part of the reason was that he was extremely intelligent. And when he went to Cambridge, he was looked down as someone who was a, who was from a colonized people. And that reaction grew in him. He said, look, these are mediocres. I, I know I am so much more intelligent they are, than they are. And yet I will always be considered uh, second class by them. That anger, I think, eventually led to his taking a, a very conservative path. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, and now, uh, uh, Fawad, can you please uh, ask your question? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Dr. Saab, it's uh, been so uh, honored for me to, to ask the question for such a big academic uh, uh, research personality because I'm uh, also in the field of research. So my question, I would come quickly to it. Uh, as you mentioned in your uh, speech that uh, everybody goes through certain stage of asking so many questions. So I'm at the moment going through that stage. So uh, as you mentioned that uh, science could cannot answer all the question that arises and and the these the the, the mullahs are the the, the uh, nowadays the, the the custodian of islam they they are you you are trying to um, neg uh, negate them uh, by these small issues like uh, uh, about images lord speaker or small issues hurt uh, uh, the the pig hurt was there so they, they are making a lot of uh, but i think they are quite small issues so my question is that uh, I want to know your opinion about that. Why we are not trying to to come up with a, the world like hybrid living, like where this science and this uh, religious live together? Like why are trying to we are trying to nullify each other? Or so like for example, uh, here in artificial intelligence, we now invented a new term, hybrid intelligence. What we are trying to do, we are we are saying like why we are trying to uh, making a robot so that it replaces human. Why not we make a robot so that it can help uh, human? They they work together. He understand you. You talk to him. He cook with you. One one, one day my supervisor he was uh, uh, making a robot and he was uh, putting clocks, uh, different type of clocks to him like uh, cook clocks and and I was telling him like then later on you would give a religion to your reward. He said, no, science is its own religion. So, mm -hmm. so I mean to say like why we are not trying, because as you mentioned, we can never answer the question, nor religion can answer all the questions or science. So I mean to say like, why not we are trying to do this hybrid thing, uh, a hybrid living or hybrid society we can, uh, uh, thank you. Okay, that's a very interesting point. Can you give um, a robot a religion? And I suggest you read Daniel Dinet on that. It's um, it, it's it's something that will occupy our minds for um, in, in the future. I would say, in terms of a hybrid way of living, already we are moving towards that. Let me give you just two or three examples. Well, in uh, the Quran, in the Hadith. Sood, interest, riba, it's also called, is haram, absolutely haram. In fact, it is said to be worse than fornication, zina. And yet the banking system in Pakistan, in Saudi Arabia, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, all work on, on interest. You can't have an economic system that will work in this world where inflation is a fact of life. If I put my money in the bank and I don't get returns on that, at the end of the year, I will have lost 7% of, or whatever the inflation rate is. And so everyone, including 
uh, Malvis in Pakistan have bank accounts. And yeah, they say that this is, we don't earn interest, it's only profit. But that profit is, is pretty much the same as interest. Example one. You remember that photography was considered haram, absolute haram, which is why there is uh, no history of over the last 1400 years, except in Iran, of uh, facial portraits in Muslim civilization. Yes, there is calligraphy, there is uh, very beautiful tiling structures, and uh, um, uh, Penrose's styles are an example of that, absolutely fantastic. But showing the face via a picture was considered terrible against Islam. And now you have television, but forget television. Now every mullah has a smartphone and you can see him taking his selfie like that. Isn't that a hybrid way of living? So yes, we are becoming more and more hybrid. But hybrid in terms of how we live, but not in terms of how we think. What we have to do is change that way of thinking. And I'm optimistic about it. It will happen with time. Thank you, Dr. Uh, and now, uh, Fahad Said, please ask your question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to see you, um, uh, Professor Hodboy, your um, former student. Just want to quickly take you 20 years back when uh, you were hosting those Gupshap Club uh, in physics department. And at that time, uh, most of your things were not digestible to me, but it took me 20 years now for and the exposure to the Western world. And, and uh, now most of the things, almost all of them make total sense. So, I mean, it takes me 20 years to get convinced. And uh, yeah, but still question arise uh, in the mind. So I have a question that uh, after having read your book, Islam and Science, um, uh, which you wrote, I guess, 30 years ago, and the foreword like was- 35, uh, yeah. 35, yeah, <laughs> still very applicable. And uh, the foreword was uh, written by Professor Abdus Salam. And we know that uh, at that time we knew as well that uh, you are quite close to him. And uh, he was he was he was the celebrated uh, scientist which uh, which the country has uh, produced not at the official level but among the scientists is the is the is the his, the, his right there at the top and but he was practicing Muslim not according to the Constitution of Pakistan but yeah according to him he was a practicing uh, he was a religious person so that uh, make make us believe that. Uh, uh, that these are not counteracting forces, uh, religion and science, not particularly Islam, but religion and science. So what is your opinion on, on this particular point? Well, Professor Salam, when he did science, he did it like anybody else. He did it like Steven Weinberg did, who, with whom he shared the Nobel Prize with. And in fact, uh, uh, in, in the book that you refer to, I specifically challenged him and said that uh, Salam and Salam, who is an avowed Muslim, and Steven Weinberg, who is an avowed atheist, nevertheless were able to come to the same exact conclusion, which proves the objectivity of science. And Salam picked up that point and said, This is absolutely right. When I do science, I do it the way everybody does. So there is that objectivity there. What happened with Salam, of course, is a tragedy. The fact that he is not recognized in Pakistan today. And in fact, nobody from this, from this subcontinent is, is considered to be one of us. So Salam has been thrown out. Um, so has, um, so has um, Sudarshan, so has um, uh, Chandrasekhar, 
but now let me give you a little bit of and and, and also Hargobin Korana Korana is from Lahore. Now let me give you a little bit of good news. You know the the black hole that was referred to earlier. This is this little community space that we have about 15 minutes from here. So we have an international board of advisors there. And uh, uh, one of our members is a Nobel Prize winner. His name is Venki Ramakrishnan. I wrote to Venki, I said, it'll be a great honor for us because you are one of us. Everybody who is born on this soil is one of us. And he very happily accepted. And we have Pakistanis, we have Indians, we have Italians, uh, we have a Chinese. But that's the way science is. It's international, it doesn't recognize boundaries. Yeah, thank you, uh, Doctor. And uh, another question uh, here, I'm uh, looking at the chat as well. It is interesting. Uh, again, uh, I hope uh, Dr. Ishtiak would also uh, like to answer it. The, um, Dr. Tanvir Khan says here, the main idea of uh, all religions was, uh, were to, was to create peace and harmony. How can we neglect 5,000 years old religion, religious belief system with just 100 and 200 years science? Nobody's asking you to neglect it, but if that, if um, a consequence is that you have to go to war against your neighbor or you uh, must consider yourself different and, and superior to your neighbor, then there's something wrong about that. Religions are not always about peace. They're sometimes all, also about war. And every religion has to be disaggregated for its different components. One of those components is how you live, how you dress, how you organize. And the other component is the metaphysical one. The metaphysical one is what will happen to you when you die? Will you go to Nirvan, Nirvana? Will you have seven rebirths? Will you go to heaven or will you go to hell? Now, that's the sort of thing that science is, is very comfortable with and says, OK, go ahead. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, it's fine. But when religions seek to create differences between humans, then they cannot. Then they are a cause for damage and destruction. And we saw that in Europe. We saw that with the 30 years war. We saw that with the 100 years war and we saw Europe tearing itself apart until finally the realization came that countries of Europe have to become secular. Separate the state from religion, otherwise you will become like what Germany and France were to each other at the time of the Thirty Years' War, in which Germany lost 40% of its population. And there weren't even nuclear weapons around at that time. Gee, uh, now, uh, doc, uh, sorry, Adnan Kakasa, please. Nationality is rapidly dying in our society. Schools and universities are not teaching it. The teachers cannot uh, discuss issues rationally as it might put them in danger. In society and the social media, we have to be extremely careful while discussing matters rationally. So how can we introduce rational thinking to our younger generation? What is the way forward? Okay. <clears throat> question. Good question. Be respectful, don't be abusive, and always state the truth. That I think is the is what everyone should do. Recognize who is around you. You cannot say the same thing when um, you have uh, people who are fired up with um, some kind of extreme emotion, like what happened in Sialkot. I don't know what that office manager said or didn't say. 
But certainly, if you don't recognize what is around you, then you put yourself in harm's way. However, the, the important thing is to be convinced of what you're saying, to have understood the, the arguments of your opponent, but to remain firm nevertheless. So we have to be in a small circle while tagging. We cannot just talk to students. I wonder how you survived. <laughs> no, 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 no. We, 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 we don't have to be in a small uh, 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 circle. Uh, like uh, Fahad, who uh, said he was at Aidyazam University 20 years ago. Is he still there? Where is he? No. Ah, Fahad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm here, sir. I'm here, sir. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> So, uh, 20 years later, if it makes a little bit of difference, fine, it's good. That's why we must consider this in the long haul and uh, keep saying these things. But look, you have to be um, reasonable in what you say. You don't go and you should not be harsh and intemperate in your language, although sometimes it's not easy to be moderate, but you have to be moderate. Thank you. Yes, um, uh, Dr. Kamran, please unmute yourself, please. Hi, uh, good to see uh, uh, Parvez. I'm also a farmer student of uh, Dr. Parvez Udbai. Uh, my uh, question is, um, if you look at the uh, top scientists of Pakistan, as uh, uh, another uh, friend, uh, father has uh, said, uh, Abdul Salam was also religious, but if uh, I know a lot of uh, students and Parvez also knows very well uh, that the uh, the top students of uh, Parvez Udbai were also religious, and one of them is also teaching at uh, Kadiyazam University now, uh, and he is a very brilliant scientist, and as uh, well as he's a, a practicing uh, uh, and very religious person. So as long as your um, your uh, your belief is not uh, stopping you doing a good science. Uh, so wh when this argument that we are uh, backward because of like friction between science and faith uh, is not wrong, then I would like to know the op opinion of uh, Parvesh you, about you're, this. You're, you're quite right that uh, this is not the um, most important thing except in certain areas. I mean, for example, evolution, that's, that's an area where um, it's impossible to do meaningful work if you think that it all started with uh, Adam and Hawa. That's different. But in terms of technical work, it doesn't matter. I think what has made Pakistan static in terms of science is the lack of ethics, scientific ethics. And I am, this is something that, that upsets me a great deal because the amount of dishonesty that we see is just phenomenal. We see that those who rise to the top in Pakistan, they become nationally acclaimed scientists what they have learned actually is the art of publishing papers and publishing papers in this day and age the internet age has become an art of deception unless we change our moral behavior and moral behavior look I, you you are people who live in the west and you know what moral behavior there is understood to be it is understood to be adherence to rule of law, to not cheat, not lie, not steal. That sort of moral behavior is um, sadly absent. And if not absent, it's, it's nearly absent. And that is the biggest enemy of academia in Pakistan. Both science, social science, art, literature, whatever. But unless we stop this wholesale plunder. Now, uh, I'm not exaggerating here, but uh, our very top scientists 
the very top three scientists. They publish their own papers in a, public, in a publication house. It's called Bentham Science, which is in Pakistan, but is advertised as located in Holland. And everyone knows this, but nobody protests because half the people are doing this. And so this is fraud that is tolerated, corruption that is tolerated. It's the cancer of immorality that has entered our bones unless you fight this. So it's not a question of religion versus science over here. That's not the issue. Here it is a question of basic personal honesty. Thank you. And uh, Mariam Saleh, uh, can you please ask your question? Unmute yourself, please. Oh. Assalamu alaikum, sir. This is again Mariam. Yes. Yes. Hello. Hello. So from the same batch from Fahad Said, you know. Yes, yes, yes. I remember you. Yeah, I know. So the sir, my question was like, as you just mentioned about the morality. So uh, about the, in the new generation, as you all already mentioned that as well, that we are lacking um, ethics, right? So how can we inculcate in the new generation that morality and ethics are superior or human values are superior to the religion? Because right now we all have calculators of Sawab and Guna, and then we think that, okay, now we are like, um, we have the license to do all kind of uh, irregularities or unethical things because we have uh, the, the, in the calculator more positive like sawab and then we can just go to Jannah with that and we are like we have the license to do be uh, unethical. So how can we inculcate in the new generation these kind of human values? You're asking me uh, how to do the impossible. You're asking <laughs> me how to how to change attitudes uh, over which, I mean, we, we are people with very limited ability to change things, some ability, and we must try as much as we can. But this whole idea of what you essentially underscored of maghfarat, maafi maang lenge, no so chuhe kha ke bili haj ko chali, aur maghfarat bhi ho gai. The idea that you can be forgiven for your sins, for your immorality, you see it everywhere. You see that these people who, who write fake papers, who steal from the government, who cheat their universities, who cheat their students, you'll see them making a beeline for the masjid on every Friday and you'll see them growing beards as long as this and you'll see their shalwars pulled up to the takhna and beyond and they think they can do what they like because look these are the these are the rules of man it's the rule of God which really matters and so corruption deep corruption happens because of this concept of forgiveness of maghfarat I don't know how to get rid of it. How to cure it? I, I, I don't know. I cannot find a way how to cure it. How to inculcate not this in my children? So I, I think it comes with a total change of attitude, of personal honesty. First of all, emphasizing that. How you bring up your kids. How they are treated in school by their teachers. All this influences what kind of people those kids become eventually. And you see that although... Um, we uh, Pakistanis, Indians, foreigners living in Europe would have a lot of difference with um, uh, the sexual morality of Europeans, yet they intensely admire their, their personal honesty, by and large. Not all of them are honest, but by and large, they, they, that kind of honesty then makes it possible to build up a society. If everybody is out to cheat and lie, then that society does not function well. Yes, uh, Masood Mirza Sahib, you, uh, you wanted to ask a question? Masood? Oh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Sahib, thank you for this illuminating uh, lecture. 
I also got the opportunity to read your book recently uh, in Urdu. It was published, I think, 20 years ago. The English edition, which you have men mentioned, that was in 1990. And this conflict between uh, progressive rationalist thinking and the orthodox thinking, which you have also pointed out in your book, it is very uh, illuminating. The problem is uh, the Western countries, they had also this problem, the same problem with the church but they got rid of this and the rationalist thinking prevailed upon orthodox. What were the reasons? Because Dr. Ishtiak Eman was also talking about this. What were the, what are the preconditions? Because is it because of industrialization? Was it because of Renaissance? How the scientific thinking started taking place and prevailing? And why is not happening in our countries, in Pakistan? Because Muslim countries, are the most backward countries at the moment in the world. And we are going back again because the populist thinking, which you have mentioned in the name of uh, like uh, Khadim Rizvi, our Imran Khan, not establishing universities, but establishing this Hatimul Nabiyin, Rahmatul Alameen Foundation. And it is, and moreover, we have a double standards, also a double educational system. Because the rich people, they have their own cadet colleges and public schools, and they get their scientific education. And then they go to the States, UK or America, and get, or they come back and then get the best jobs also. So what should, how this secularism or scientific way of thinking, uh, this thing should prevail in Pakistan? Uh, because Pakistan is also being dominated by, by civil and military elites and they are not interested. Where it should start? What is your opinion? Because you are so an educationist and our elite is not interested in changing this education system. Thank you, sir. I can't say where it should start. It, it is happening in various places in Pakistan, individuals who have um, been exposed now to the outside world through the internet, they have formed their opinion. They they have uh, read um, books now. They have also seen videos, and so that change is happening. I would say that in universities in Pakistan, between five to ten percent of students are progressive, secular minded. They can't speak up, but over time they will become important as well. If you want to look at things historically, why did it happen in Europe? Why did the scientific revolution happen there, not in Pakistan? That's a big, big question. But one very important element over there is how the universities in the West were so absolutely firm in, in, in insisting on academic truth. They did not allow um, the, these uh, frauds to, to prosper. And so even though there was no requirement to publish in those days, there was an academic tradition and they built upon that academic tradition. One small correction to what you have said, sir, and that is uh, Imran Khan is also building universities and those universities are going to be just as terrible as the other universities that we have, maybe worse. It's not a question of building universities. It's a question of making universities work as universities. There, if universities are used to propagate that kind of backward thinking, then what is the use of having them? As far as cadet colleges and Petaro and this and that, that's a matter of the past now. What has happened, I don't know how well you are aware of it, in Punjab, our ordinary schools have been converted into madrasas. One lakh mullahs have been brought out from madrasas into public schools. And this is the so-called single national curriculum, which was supposed to even up the playing field. But the other thing hasn't happened. Not one science teacher has gone into a madrasa, has been, has been recruited into 
madrasas. It was supposed to be an equal exchange. It's a wholly unequal exchange. Now you have policemen with dandas standing at the public schools, checking to see if the kids are learning the Quran. So, uh, Dr. Uh, one other question uh, from a chat uh, uh, from chat box. It is about. Uh, 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 it is asked uh, by Huzefa Saqib, and uh, he says that can the faith and science be put on the same merit scale as religion? Is it better to be dogmatic about scientific method as opposed opposed to religion? No, no, science is never dogmatic. Science is, science always says that this is work in progress. We, with time, improve ourselves. So it's a building that's being made and that building is never complete. On the other hand, religion is always complete. Religion was complete the day that it was revealed. Us, that's it. Science says, okay, we'll make this hypothesis. Does it work? Okay, very nice if it works. If it doesn't, throw it away. We'll try something else. There is no dogmatism in science. However, we are dogmatic about one thing. I am dogmatic about one thing. Let me admit it. <coughs> I am dogmatic about the need to check, to test, to see if predictions come true. Otherwise, why should I believe something? I want to see proof. I want to see logic. Otherwise, I'm listening to fairy tales. So I am dogmatic in that way. Gee. Uh, uh, here is a question I couldn't uh, um, understand, but uh, still uh, I'm obliged to um, read it out uh, because uh, Mr. Khan here wants uh, Dr. <coughs> opinion on it. Religion uh, existence is threatened by science and modern liberal way of thinking. Uh, some people think religion needs to be phased out through modernization process like Gandhi is doing. Other things that uh, we should not do the modernization in which, in which case the clash will be violent but short. What's your thought on it? I don't, I think that's putting it in very drastic terms. I give you examples where even very conservative people are changing the way in which they live. Who would have thought that that ordinary Pakistanis, ordinary Saudi Arabians would ever watch television? It, you know, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, who's a, who's a great liberal among Muslims, he never had his portrait, he never had his picture taken, except towards the very end when somebody somehow took a picture of him. He was opposed to the idea of photography, explicitly rejected it. Okay, now if somebody as progressive as that rejects it, you can see how other people at that time would have been looking at the notion of uh, of of uh, photography. The, the English had come with cameras and by and large it was rejected. Now, now they will not only happily take selfies, I don't know what it is that they won't watch. So things evolve. Ways of living have evolved. There's not that violent clash anymore. Yes, Dr. Isiak, please. Sir, unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Professor Hoodboy, you have given 
Sir Sayyid many times as an example of a liberal thinker. I think that is very questionable. Uh, he was only liberal in the in a political sense that if if the Muslim uh, Ashrafia is to survive and maintain its privileges, it must start doing what the English are doing. But when it came to ordinary Muslims, he was the most arch conservative, actually a reactionary. And there are many examples, for example, this Anglo Mohammedan college, which he established, some people in Muradabad or Bareilly, one of these places, tried to uh, uh, emulate that uh, <coughs> school. And he was invited to come and inaugurate this school, you know. And then uh, these were poor people. They had the courtyard of the mosque in which they were going to have the students. And he said, what sort of people are going to attend the school where English education will be given? And they said, well, Muslim children of shopkeepers, small cultivators, uh, artisans, you know, people who live here. And he was very angry. And he said, modern education is deserved only by the Ashrafia. Ordinary Muslims should be kept where they belong. And under no circumstance uh, are they entitled to such an education. And there are many other examples where he comes out in a most brutal manner about ideas of equality. Like in one of the meetings of the Ashrafia, he said that this ICS exam, which is, which is held in England, should not be brought to India. Why? Because maybe the children of ordinary Muslims who get an MA degree may also qualify to be an officer. And will you accept his authority? And everybody shouted, no, no, no. So I think this contradiction in Sir Sayyid cannot be uh, uh, ignored if you describe him as a liberal. I think yeah, that's no. highly yeah. objectionable. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually quite agree with you that he's not a paragon of liberalism. Um, and in fact, you didn't mention women, but he was also very yes. anti-woman. Huh? So I agree with you on that. Um, but the, the, the reason I mentioned him was that among the more enlightened Ashrafia of that time, even he would not agree to have his picture taken. So it was in that context that I mentioned. Thank you. And uh, Mariam, uh, you want to ask another question, please? Uh, I'm sorry, it's Fahad. Okay. Sorry. I, no, oh. my back died out and uh, Mariam lent me the phone. Oh. Uh, briefly uh, with the condition that I'll ask the same question. So let me try. So uh, Dr. Pervez, you uh, just said, uh, so this is just one point with, uh, uh, I think I, I would like to have more clarity because you said that uh, the religion need. Um, so, I mean, if we, if we go through the, the literature, the, the religious literature and we talk about the Fasid, and if we compile all the tafsir in in Islam, I mean, only if we write the name of the of the tafsir and the and the name of the authors, I think we'll end up with a with quite a reasonable uh, kind of a hefty book. Only the names. So there have been many interpretations of of religion uh, of of Islam, and uh, if you compare uh, other religion like Christianity, what was happening during the Dark Ages, and how the religion is practiced right now. There have been huge differences. Uh, so, uh, do you think that uh, a more moderate interpretation of of religion should be encouraged in the um, in in the present world? Well, um, I think people make their choices. There are a lot of people, not a lot, but uh, at least a few percent of people who like to listen to somebody like Javed Gamadi. Earlier on, it was Ghulam Ahmad Parvez. Uh, even before that, there was uh, um, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. And um, 
in in the western in the arab world you had uh, people like rashid rida and uh, his uh, teacher whatever is I forget his name you had these liberal thinkers zia gop gokal in in turkey who did influence a lot of people and if you want to be influenced in that way why not um people after all make selections based upon their their experiences based upon which family they were born to the school they went to and so forth so uh why should one uh, try and stop more tafsirs from being written let let more be written let people choose let this be a supermarket of of tafsirs yes a uh, name arif uh, do you want to ask any question because you have yes been... please thank you thank you sorry Allah. i <laughs> thank you yeah uh, thank you very much prasab for your uh, enlightening lecture uh, we have one thing com- common i'm also a, a, an educational educationist and i live in a city where spinoza lived and is buried he has to flee amsterdam because of his ideas he came to the hague uh some uh, part of his life last part of his life and he's also buried in in the hague so my question oh, is sorry who is this spinoza is spinoza. spinoza is talking spinoza ah, 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 ah. I, i live in a city where spinoza is as ah, okay there. okay yeah. so my question is are we able to produce a spinoza a voltaire a descartes or a volt or erasmus are there conditions in south asia that we are able to produce people like 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 that hmm. i think the marketplace of ideas now is uh, is quite um, extensive we have uh, people who have sifted through the major ideas of the 20th century i am particularly fond of uh, sipte hasan who uh, wrote a whole series of books for musa se marx tak navi de fikr etc in which he brilliantly summarized what uh, were the main political th- trends of uh, earlier ages including the en- the enlightenment including the period of descartes and diderot and rousseau and Voltaire and uh, then what happened Bacon and so forth. So yeah, uh, we need more of that certainly. More contemporary thinking. The more people who think, the better it is for any society. The point is to get people to think somehow. I don't know how to do that. I've tried all my life and I've. Um, maybe succeeded 2% of the time but that's okay that's the way it happens so we all have to keep trying if you can make for if you can do better and make but 2% 4% that's that's still better but it begins with academic freedom yeah yeah i think it starts with academic freedom that is the basis right and yeah. you have to fight for academic freedom you don't get academic freedom served to you on a platter so be prepared to face the consequences yeah thank you very much and um, i'm going to take uh, last question um, if uh, you allow me because uh, time is running out michael uh, you want to ask uh, one question shortly short please um yeah i just wanted to comment on javed gamdi because i uh heard him quite a few times and people say he's very enlightened and he's uh, trying to mo- moderate islam and things like that but most of the time he never answers the question he goes on and on and on and on and then you know in in, in urdu say ghumata hai all the time he is you know and then one of the i've, I've uh, gone through one of his uh, a discussion about noah's ark and uh, somebody said that uh, we don't have any scientific evidence of uh, noah's ark and then he said these stupid scientists 
they don't know what kul means. Kul doesn't mean all. Kul just means the specific specific region. And and then he says that then it makes sense. Even then it, it doesn't make sense. But this this is the type of things Gandhi is is preaching. And I, I'm, I'm, I don't know I don't know why people why people are admiring him. So I'm really sorry about that. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Michael, for <laughs> giving us uh, this. Well, let, let, let me give you my yeah. little experience with uh, Ramadi Saab. And this was after the 2005 earthquake. And we were on television together with uh, two other religious leaders. And the anchor asked, um, why did this earthquake happen? And they all gave their explanations. Well, the, the two religious ones, they said, they were fairly orthodox. They said, this is the wrath of God, Azabe Lai. Ramadi was very, um, was more circumspect. He said, this is not Azabe Lahi, this is Tambi e Lahi. Tambi means warning. So <laughs> the, it came as a warning uh, because you're not doing, you're not living right. You know, the whole business of womanizing and then drinking and all that. So that's the problem. So then the anchor asked me and uh, says, Professor, what do you think? So I gave them a little bit of history about how the earth was formed and all that. And uh, they didn't agree. So then I got the opportunity to ask my question. And I asked the Malvis there and Javed Ghamadi, why earthquakes happen on the moon? They couldn't figure that out and the program and the anchor called for a commercial break at that point. Yeah, that's the problem. Exactly. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> Muhammad Ali, please uh, ask your question. <laughs> Muhammad Ali. Um, uh, hello, good evening. Yeah, good evening. Uh, Dr. I have a question. It was earlier, uh, it was written in the chat box, but I'm not sure if it was answered. Uh, could you please recommend some books on religion and science, their coexistence or the conflict between them for students who are from uh, non-scientific background, please? Well, <coughs> I'm sorry, I have to now go, but <coughs> Richard Dawkins writes very well. Sam Harris writes well. Daniel Dinette writes well. And uh, you might want to look at their books. There are lots of people who write good books, but these are particularly good authors. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, and now um, I'm... Uh the mic to uh, Wahid Bhatti. Uh, Wahid Bhatti, sir, please uh, uh, proceed uh, for the closing. Okay. Oh, I will again do the share screen for a minute. <coughs> so we are we did this question answer session. Okay, let me do the formal closing because a lot has been said and I think the level of discussion question answer was absolutely fantastic. Uh, let me just, uh, what I made notes, what has been discussed, just just uh, again, going back to put, it, put everything in the broader perspective as uh, Dr. Hudbai explained uh, and it, responding to several questions. <coughs> As far as science is concerned, everything in the world is discernible and it's always tentative. It's never finished, it's always moving and you keep on trying new things. It's an ongoing process which includes explanations, hypothesis, theories, discovery of laws, et cetera, et cetera. And it deals with empirical knowledge. So, and it always doubts the situation, doubts the hypothesis. It asks questions and it creates critical thinking. And critical thinking is not only crucial in science because we were talking about our scope of this topic. Critical thinking is also extremely important for the entire society. 
because we have been discussing about why we didn't make those progresses other uh, societies are making. Uh, a, a very significant part of it is the lack of critical thinking, thinking or discouragement of uh, critical thinking. Uh, on the other side, when we talk about faith, it's a body of beliefs as opposed to always tentative and always a process. So it's a given and it's the package. I mean, you take it or you leave it and that there's no room for you uh, having doubts or, or asking critical questions. It's, it's based on the belief that a supernatural, sacred, divine power controlling it controls our destiny. It's, it's I mean, nothing wrong with it. Uh, it's, it's up to people to decide for themselves. And it believes in finality of itself and absolutism. And I think this is one important area, which, which again was touched upon several times by various people and in particular by Dr. Rudbeck, that if something is, is, if it's the absolute truth and every person from every faith, it's not just Islam, take any faith, they believe in the superiority of their own religion and that's the absolute truth. So there is bound to be uh, uh, friction and conflict if you if you say I am the most superior or what I believe in is something more superior. Now a part of it which is not really faith but which in this context which also comes in are our old practices, our traditions, our superstitions and that was superstitions and traditions developed as Hudba also indicated during the process of when we were trying to find answers to unanswerable questions uh, way back and even today. Uh, then coexistence of science and faith is absolutely probable. It actually exists. We talked talk, talk many times about this hybrid society and existence of faith and, uh, and in science together. It is probable and it happens in most societies, actually probably in all societies. But we need to define and agree on their relationship and their scope. Uh, and as it was mentioned rightfully, that when they overlap, then the friction starts. If they don't overlap, if, if everything is in its own orbit, then you have no friction and they can live happily ever after. The antagonism between them and in the society will increase and we see it increasing if the conflicts are not understood and they are not openly debated. So we have to go with an open mind to have these discussions and try to understand each other's position. If we condemn each other, if we, uh, if our ingoing position is that my truth is the absolute truth, then you can't have, can't possibly have a debate. But the good news, which was also mentioned several times that the benefits of science, they are resulting in more positive attitude to it because as we, even most, most orthodox among us, when they enjoy the fruits of science from mobile phone to, to TV, to having your own YouTube channel and rest of it, you simply uh, start kind of, uh, it becomes a hybrid society, whether you keep on rejecting it, but at the same time, you are enjoying all the fruits and benefits which, which science is, is offering to you. Uh, and there was a question about why 100 to 200 years of science we believe in religions 5,000. I think that's also is a misconception that the modern science is 200 years, but the science, the evolution, it, go, it goes to prehistoric period, even in the period when the passing on of knowledge was an oral tradition and there was no writing, there was no printing and so on and so forth. So we see the development of the numbering system, which was around 3000 BCE. So science is not just 100, 200 years old. Uh, and if you look at geometry, Pythagorean theorem, astronomical observations, founding of Platinum Academy in 387 BCE, achievements in Arab mathematics and so on and so forth. And we, some, of the Muslim scientists are met, uh, mentioned. And this is also an ongoing in debate in society like, now oh, we have many scientists, we have produced and science wouldn't exist without us. It's true. I mean, Muslims and Arabs, they have produced many, many brilliant science, uh, scientists. We have uh, Ibn al-Haytam was mentioned, but there are many more and they are not all. It's not an exhaustive list. There are, there are many, many more. And interesting thing is that many Muslim scientists, they were inspired by faith. They were inspired by their curiosity. curiosity. They were inspired by their, uh, 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 by, by several other things. Uh, spirituality, for example, 
and so were non-Muslims. I mean, this, this, this curiosity and inspiration by faith is not really limited to us or to Muslims. It's, it can happen to to person of any faith or without faith. So these things are not, uh, not really kind of reserved for us. And also interesting thing, these days we take a lot of pride in in many of the scientists which we produced in history, Muslim scientists or so-called Muslim scientists. But we forget one thing. They, most of them or many of them were, when they were alive, they were punished, they were imprisoned, even killed or deported for their this so-called liberal thinking or messing up uh, with the nature. We have Dr. Abdul Salam was mentioned. Uh, it, was a, it was a very clear case that he, when he was considered Muslim, we took ownership of him. He's a brilliant scientist, a Nobel Prize winner, our person, our man, Muslim brother, etc. But when he was declared non-Muslim, we threw paint on his pictures, we tear apart his posters, and we disowned him, and we tried to remove him from the history books. So why? I mean, because this, even if he drew all his inspiration from, from the holy book or from faith or not, his his... His, his research, his findings didn't change because his faith was uh, changed. He didn't change it, we changed it. Now, many inventions and discoveries by science have also been dis disputed by faith and who by mentioned vaccination, loudspeakers, photography, TV and printing press. They all, we have been, all been there. They have been fatwas against all these things. They were haram, haram, haram. But when we, over time, when we saw the benefits of it, we not only adopted them, we started owning them. So now it is, it's, it's a, it's a non-issue. Uh, impact on society was a, was a, was a part of our scope. Uh, there were questions and answers on that. And I think the fundamental education policy and, <coughs> and, and, and mixing up these two things, science and religion has contributed. It's not the only region, it's not the, the most significant reason, but it has contributed to the rise of extremism and to fanaticism. And it has somehow disturbed or torn apart our social fabric. Our social relations have changed uh, completely. Uh, and we, we look at each other, as Udbay also mentioned, looking at uh, your neighbor as your enemy, uh, be just because he prays in a slightly different way. Our attitude towards minorities changed. Look at Dr. Salam uh, and, and, and other incidents and other minorities. Uh, the entire culture of the country, it, it, it was impacted by, by this kind of debate because if the madrasas are taught that it's still the earth is flat, it's aesthetic, it doesn't move, and you are people giving lectures and telling children to not to believe uh, what scientists say, uh, and this has in return all impact on our economics and how country performs in terms of money, in terms of economics uh, and, and GDP inventions, uh, de development, all this has an, and which is actually should be the first one is the education policy. If this is integrated, this thought is integrated into the education policy, then basically uh, well, you are on the, on the path uh, downwards. Uh, I'm not going to read through all this, Hudbai mentioned a, a, a couple of those, uh, that what education, if this thought really gets into the education, what it does. And I'll just take, take the first one. Uh, one of the books, which is in the syllabus, it quotes, most of the other religions of the world claim equality, but they never act on it. Then the second one says, uh, honesty for Muslims is merely a, for non-Muslims is merely a business strategy while for Muslims, it is a matter of faith. And then we say religion plays a very important role in promoting national harmony. If the entire population believes in one religion, that, in, that encourages nationalism, etc. So what does it imply? What are we teaching these kids? That if we all belong to the same religion, we can live in harmony. And all those who don't belong to our religion not, are not part of us. They, don't, they, they, sh they shouldn't be here. And, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, there are a couple of uh, more examples. Uh, the, the, the better Muslim we become, uh, the better citizen we will prove to be. So it means that people, non-Muslims in Pakistan can never be a good citizen. Uh, so these kinds of, this is what does, and this is the foundation then on which we are, we are building up. So this conflict is not just a kind of uh, some friction between, between two uh, <coughs> outlooks, 
but it really has much, much deeper impact on our psyche, on our collective character, uh, and, and, and how, we, how we behave with each other in the world. Bringing Carl Sagan back, he said something very nice once. He said, in science, it often happens that scientists say, hey, you know, that's really a good argument. My position is mistaken. And then they would actually change their minds. And you will nev never heard that old view from them again. They really do it. It doesn't happen as often as it should because scientists are also human and change is sometimes painful, but it happens every day. So what he basically was trying to explain there is that you don't have scientists who say, if you don't agree with my hypothesis, that's blasphemy. Uh, so you have to agree with me or else. So that doesn't happen. So science, actually, it is not in the scope of science or, or interest of science to go after faiths or, or try to disprove faiths because they, they, it's, it's not their cup of tea anyway. They are not bothered with it. They are focused in their own, uh, on their own uh, task and, and they continue uh, doing it. Now, last slide in the last, last analysis, actually, and this comes to now making a political statement here, all his struggles are class struggles. It all is about between exploiters and the exploited. Don't Muslims exploit Muslims? Don't Christians exploit Christians? Don't Buddhists exploit other Buddhists? They all do. They all misuse one way or the other religion to justify their exploitation. It's the power. If they, they have to keep the power in their own hands to keep people supporting it. So they would, I mean, a, 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 a Buddhist never thinks twice before you say, I'm not going to exploit a Buddhist because he's my ESM religion. No, he doesn't even know. And last point, they not only use religion to exploit, they at the same time use all the benefits of the science to get more richer and more, and more powerful. Uh, so thank you, that was, uh, that was it. Uh, I am going back to stop sharing. So we can, uh, so this was, uh, folks, thank you very much. This was, uh, I think, very, very uh, fantastic discussion. Dr. Rudbai and all other participants, thank you very much. We will keep the lines open as it's, it's a tradition of OPP after official part, we keep the lines open for about uh, an hour or so, 45 minutes, an hour. And people who were not able to ask certain questions, uh, they can still ask, they can net, do some networking, they can discuss each other with each other or some other questions they want to discuss. So this is a kind of uh, more or less uh, 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 freestyle now. Uh, so enjoy this time and uh, talk to each other, get to know each other, ask questions, uh, get your points of views known without any hesitation. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks.